I wanted to ask this because you mentioned it a little bit earlier in the episode, how um, neuroplasticity, you know, you're not, your brain isn't as, let's say, plastic or, or you can't change certain pathways as easily past the age of 25 to 28. And when you're a kid, it's much easier to learn new things, much easier to pick up new um, ideas and learn about them, right? And that worries a lot of people, uh, including myself. So I was curious, uh, what practices can people take or things that they can be doing day to day that can allow them to learn new things, get rid of bad pathways or bad habits and, and form new ones that are going to be of more benefit to them if they're older? Yeah. Great question. So we now know that neuroplasticity is the consequence of two steps in a process. And this is non-childhood plasticity. Child plasticity, the whole brain is set up for plasticity. So the best thing we can do is try and ensure good experiences for them and diverse range of experiences and um, obviously trying to avoid trauma and these kinds of things. If people have traumas, that's a separate issue, like getting through trauma. Um, that's probably a whole other podcast discussion, um, ways of purging trauma. They're everything from holotropic breathing to psychotherapy to psychedelics, right? There's a ton of categories to go down for adults. The two steps of the process of plasticity are extreme focus and extreme rest. And the rest does not have to be sleep. So the actual rewiring of brain circuitry occurs during sleep and non-sleep rest. There's a beautiful study just published on this, that 20 minute naps or deliberate deep compression after a learning episode, just tuning out can enhance the plasticity process, speed it up, et cetera. Now, extreme focus is hard. No one should beat up on themselves if their mind drifts and comes back. Everyone does that. I think some people think that like, they aren't focusing and that like certain people can just focus in a tunnel all the time. We have an obsession with flow and I'm friends with Steven Kotler and I always tease him like flow has this concept of flow is so attractive. This idea, there's this space where everything's working great. And I would say flow is when everything's going the way you want it to. And it is a real and interesting and meaningful state of mind. And I, um, and I'm doing some work with Steven and those guys to try and tap into it a little bit more and figure out what the science is, but don't chase flow chase intense focus and then intense relaxation. The intense focus should last as long as you can maintain intense focus plus a little bit more. I say plus a little bit more time because that's going to encourage plasticity of the focusing system itself and you'll get better at it. Work done by my colleague at Stanford who's now retired, but beautiful work that still stands, a guy named Eric Knudsen showed that under conditions of high attention, because of it, literally because of acetylcholine and short bouts of intense effort and learning can promote the plasticity process in adulthood best. And that's because of the neuromodulators that creates acetylcholine acts as kind of like a highlighter pen for the synapses that need to change. Those changes occur later in these periods of rest and deep sleep, mainly slow wave sleep. So for people wearing whoop or aura, and you're looking at your sleep, the proportion of deep sleep, slow wave sleep is, is the thing to pay attention to. So, I think that having a plasticity practice that's geared around learning specific things is way more important and more scientifically grounded than just having like plasticity. People talk about plasticity. They're like, bro, I'm stuck. I'm microdosing psilocybin for 30 days. I'm like, why? And they're like, I'm, I want plasticity. I'm like, cool. What are you trying to change? And they're like, huh? I'm like, they're just plasticity. That's crazy and potentially dangerous. That experiment was run in the sixties. Okay. That's called changing your brain without a specific end goal in mind. It's called opening up the opportunity for plasticity without directing it down a particular path. Now I am, first of all, I can't, the legality is still an issue, right? Cause these things are illegal. So I'm obviously not going to encourage people to use them, but psychedelics do hold some interesting therapeutic potential. They're labs looking at this, they're clinical trials, but all of those are geared towards specific endpoints. So am I going to give people a hard time for taking psilocybin? No, it's not my job. I'm not a cop, right? I'm a scientist. However, I think people need to think about what is it I'm trying to change? Am I trying to learn a language? Am I trying to be more empathic? Am I trying to be more focused? Am I trying to like eliminate some negative self-talk or even better? Am I trying to build in some growth mindset? So what is it that they're doing? And if you're going to use a pharmaceutical regime, 
understand that that opens the plasticity window, but there is nothing that's going to occur during that sitting. I don't care who the shaman is. I don't care what it is that's going to happen in that bubble that is as important as the tail and everything that happens for the three or four weeks afterward. Okay. So if people are going to hit this with a pharmaceutical or a drug approach, understand the plasticity doesn't happen then. You think it does because it's some sort of peak experience. Plasticity occurs in the days and weeks of sleep afterward. So, and for people that don't want to go the psychedelic route, which frankly I think is the, should be the last approach. I think for most people, especially kids, right, or young adults, you still have some plasticity. Tap into that plasticity through focused bouts of extreme effort incrementally extending that effort and then learning to relax. So it kind of goes back to the theme we talked about earlier, learning to focus, learning to dial out that focus. And it works when you talk to people in, you know, really high performing, high consequence communities, they all have a mantra of crawl, walk, run. They understand crawl, walk, run. Everybody wants that. I'm not saying you were asking this, but I'm just kind of like reading into the the dialogue I hear out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants that trampoline. It's going to trampoline them up to the 15th floor. And it's like, uh uh-uh, it's a staircase. That 15th floor that you trampoline to is imaginary. There is no trampoline. You come crashing back down. And it's not to say there isn't some utility to these things, but... The staircase is the key. And the cool thing about the staircase approach to plasticity or the staircase approach to making any of the kinds of changes we talked about today about focus, sleep, self-reward, et cetera, is early on the stairs are set further apart. But because of plasticity, as you get better at the process, the stairs start to become shorter and in between. And pretty soon it does become easier to run that. I kind of think of it like a spiral staircase. But early on, it's always going to be more of a struggle. And I think most people don't get past that first five or 10 stairs because they don't know how to use self-reward. They're looking outward. They're like that infant, like, eh, it's uncomfortable. And they, they're looking elsewhere and they're not working these neural circuits that are deep within them that are built for this kind of thing. So I don't mean to be vague about it. I could say crossword puzzles. I could say... Um, learning games, but I think whatever you put your mind to, it should be specific and you want to dig in hard and then relax, dig in hard and then relax. Maybe one or two sessions a day. We can learn from kids though. An element of play is powerful. It it, play keeps that norepinephrine dopamine balance just right. So if you can approach learning an instrument as an adult, as like, all right, maybe your dream is to be on stage someday. Maybe it's just to not sound terrible, but the idea is like, it's playful. You're going to be able to work with it. The famous scientist and physicist, Nobel prize winner, Richard Feynman. This is a guy who learned how to paint in his late sixties. He learned a bongo drum in his sixties. He was kind of wild, man. He like bongo drum naked on the roof of Caltech. Nowadays I get you fired, but he was kind of a wild one, but he had this sense of play. And I think he used it as a way to kind of not go over that edge where it's like, damn it, I'm not getting it. It was like kind of fun. You know, you can keep that going. And I think that we should we should all invoke a little bit of play in our in our mindset and our orientation toward learning, because a lot of people are are dead at the gate because they're like, I got to do this thing. I need to learn. I don't want to get dementia or whatever. Like you're you spent out all your norepinephrine. You don't have any room to learn or to focus. 